we start with the second session of the day. This session is dedicated to determination of best interest of children, family disputes, issues and challenges. For the opening remarks we have with us, Honorable Mr. Justice Anupinder Singh Garewal, who is a blend of the bar and the bench. He joined the bar in the year 1992. He was appointed as the additional advocate journal in the year 2005. He was elevated in the year 2014. 22 years at the bar and now eight years as a judge of the Honorable High Court. Judicial education normally means providing opportunities to the young judges to have the experienced judges sharing their experience with the younger judges. And therefore, the rich experience that the measuring rod for carrying out this particular session. May I request just a while to make the opening remarks for this particular session. Over to Justice Karewa. I am thankful to Dr. Gupta for giving me the opportunity to participate in the workshop on family courts. The topic of discussion in this session is of immense significance. The law on the subject is evolving, but considerable progress has been made in recent times. And you have the domain experts who will be delineating further on the subject. I would just narrate my experience. The first brush I had with the concept of shared parenting was when I was a student in Delhi in the 1980s. One of my classmates was staying with his mother in Delhi. The parents had separated. The father had even remarried. But the mother and the father, they were in regular touch, speaking to each other on the phone, sharing the concerns about the well-being and upbringing of the children. One of the children had to undergo a minor medical procedure. The father came all the way down to Delhi and both the parents were there when they took the child to the hospital. And in the evening, they would have dinner together. The father was staying elsewhere, but they would have meal together. The entire family is there. There, that's how I got to know this concept of shared parenting. And both the children, they developed into responsible citizens with well-rounded personality. But when I started practicing in Chandigarh, I didn't have a very good experience when I saw some bitter custody battles over the children. I will just narrate recently, there was a petition for habeas corpus which had come up before me at the instance of the mother. She was present and she was, of course, she was disturbed, understandably so. And she would not even allow her lawyer to speak. She would say, my child has been taken away straight away, give me the custody. So I tried to give her a patient hearing, try to reason with her and told her, let's try mediation. She was opposed to it. Even the lawyer for the other side also came. They were also hesitant. But then with some persuasion, I was able to send them for mediation. And after mediation, then they said some progress has been made, but lots. I said, if some progress has been made, we go to give it another shot. Then I kept it for a day to day hearing and I was. It gave me immense satisfaction when the matter was resolved. 
the custody of course with, with the mother and with visitation rights and periodic and whatever was mutually agreed upon i mean that gave me a lot of satisfaction so what i intend to say is that the family court should uh, deal the matter in a with a lot of patience and sensitivity it's not a like an ordinary legal dispute to be decided after hearing arguments and close it has to be patiently and we need to i think strengthen our mechanism we are already doing it for counseling and referring such disputes for mediation because even in pandemic i believe uh, the parent in some cases of course the who had the custody of the child has tried to deny the visiting rights to the other parent so these uh, disputes also need to be resolved and now this concept now the uh, concept of best interest of the child has to be adjudicated while keeping in view the interest of the child which is of paramount importance rather than the interests of the parents not now what normally what happens is the child uh, parents are going to uh, have the custody of visiting rights as per their convenience of course their convenience has to be addressed but there are other issues and the supreme court also i think both the experts are there they'll be referring to the judgments in detail there is uh, the supreme court in the case of asuda sethi in 2022 um, has held that a child's welfare and not the individual or personal legal right of the parents are of paramount importance in a custody battle in fact the welfare of the child must get precedence over the parents rights then there are other judgments also this uh, vivek singh was a romani singh the supreme court highlighted the concept of parental alienation syndrome which refers to the unjustified disdain of a child towards his or her parents which very often it happens they are using the child as a pawn and sometimes uh, one parent is trying to tell the child about i mean uh, that in a way in a, uh, the image of the other parent is shown in a negative light so not realizing that in the process the child is suffering so these issues now the family courts are well equipped now they can even devise their own procedure to some extent to resolve these disputes i think other ex, uh, aspects are there for our experts to delineate uh, mr anil malhotra of course is a domain expert and very well widely acclaimed <laughs> internationally and uh, mrs madhu khanna lali of has got experience judicial experience in deciding such cases and of course i'll won't take much time i hope i have not overshot my mark so thank you very much thank you so much just very well you have focused the issue as such ultimately in deciding adjudicating all these issues what is in the best interest of the child is of paramount importance and i'm sure the two presentations this morning that we are going to have one from mr anil malhotra and the other from madhu khanna lali are going to focus on the different aspects relating to the best interest of children in this particular context i thank justice garewal i know you are busy and therefore be so very kind of you to be with us this morning and we look forward to your association in our future programs as well thank you so much i would now request in fact i had introduced both anil and madhu yesterday and since they are sharing the session today again i would now request mr anil malhotra to proceed with his presentation in this particular context over to anil thank you sir uh, honorable justice garewal lord denning dr balram gupta and my learned esteemed colleague judge madhu khanna lali and kartas of the judiciary the legal guardians of children 
who is a child is a child a person who is a entity under 18 years of age i would say no child is the father of man from that perspective if we look at a child let us first go to the nitty gritty of the very basis of the concept of the best interest of the child since the topic session is determination of the best interest of the child now india signed the united nation convention on the rights of the child in 1992 wherein a child was considered to be a person with a right to life right to a nationality right to a home right to a family and so on and so forth india crystallized all these rights piecemeal way in different legislations but the real legislation came when india amended the unite when india amended the juvenile justice care and protection of children act first it was of 2008 then it was of 2010 then ultimately came the act of 2015 now a lot of us do not know that the only legislation which defines the best interest of the child is section 2 subsection 9 of the juvenile justice care and protection of children act 2015 i would like to read this definition because it took me almost 10 years to convince the delhi, the delhi high court to start with and then ultimately the supreme court that this is a definition you have to look into because none of the personal law legislations or the guardian and wards act defines what is the best interest of the child so the simple meaning of the definition of the best interest of the child which has been picked up in a wholesome way from the entire collection of rights emanating from the uncrc are given in this subsection now once india signed the uncrc it was obligated to incorporate in domestic laws whatever was contained in the convention to give force or give teeth to the meaning of the convention so best interest of the child means the basis for any decision taken regarding the child to ensure fulfillment of his basic rights and needs identity social well being and physical emotional and intellectual development so this is the wholesome definition of the best interest of the child now when i engaged in this argument the objection of the bench and of the opposing councils were that the jj act is an act which applies to children in conflict with law but then the jj act also applies to children in need of care and protection now one of the categories of the children in need of care and protection are children uh, or a child who resides with a person whether a guardian of the child or not and such person has injured exploited abused or neglected the child or has violated the rights or any other law for the timing in force meant for the protection of the child so when a parent decides to take singular custody of the child the rights of the child are being violated so therefore the child is a child in need of care and protection and therefore comes the definition of the juvenile justice act the best interest of the child now when i urged this expression to be taken note of in habeas corpus petitions in the delhi high court first of all i was able to convince the division bench headed by justice vipin sanghi then i was able to convince the bench of justice sanghi and 
ultimately this concept was accepted when i urged submissions before justice khanvilkar in the supreme court and now of course this wholesome definition is often taken care of and is noticed so my respectful and humble submission to honorable judges of the family courts is please feel free to hold the scales of determination of the best interest of the child with keeping in the weights of the definition given in the jj act to determine what is the best interest of the child the rights of the parties ashish ranjan lari sakhamuri ruchi maju supreme court says are immaterial the scales must rest on the best interest of the child and what are your weights what are your balancing gadgets is the definition given in section 2 sub section 9 so with this brief opening in a child centered jurisprudence please look at the child hold the scales to determine his best interest leave the mother and the father apart and determine as you would as your conscience would allow you to decide what is the best interest of the child now to go into some concepts for a better determination i will briefly run through some provisions of the hindu minority and guardianship act and the guardian and wards act so that the way i would look at them i would like to explain in my way that there is lot more that we sometimes ordinarily miss so first of all section 3 or section 2 of the hmga says that the expressions used in this act and the provisions of this act are in addition to and not in derogation of the guardian and wards act so the hmga is only a supplemental legislation and for you as honorable judges you know that hmga does not contain any substantive right to take you to a remedy in a court you have to invoke the gwa which is an archaic 135 year old colonial law but that's that's what it is then comes the expression guardian who is a guardian guardian means the person having the care of the person of the minor and includes a natural guardian so i pause here if a natural guardian as a parent holds and has that title on him can he be declared or sought to be declared a natural guardian to the exclusivity of the other parent but this is a question which the supreme court has answered in amal loya's case i will come to it later but please pause can you divest a natural guardian of his responsibility of his rights of his duties the answer is no unless and the answer is in section 19 of the guardian and wards act you have to declare him unfit before you get rid of that statutory statutory responsibility which he carries on his shoulders now with this i come to section 6 which is a very meaningful and a very very important provision because we get mixed up in vesting jurisdiction by reading section 6 of the hmga alone now i have been able to bring about this after almost 37 years in the profession and having gone through different judgments of different courts and being before the supreme court one is able to get a clearer view by reading rereading and expanding in a different way now section 6 says that the natural guardian of a hindu minor shall be the father and the mother they are both equal that is of course well settled by the supreme court in 
the case of uh, G- Gita Hariharan. But what does it say further? Provided that the custody of a minor who has not completed the age of five years shall ordinarily be with the mother. Now, this there is a lot said in this. On a first reading, we miss it. So, first of all, a minor, on a plain reading of this, minor under five years of age, custody shall be with the mother. The guardianship of the father goes nowhere. So, please don't mix up the two phrases. Then let's come to the word ordinarily. Now, over a period of time, ordinarily was meant to be read as shall, not may. Means ordinarily was read to be carrying a statutory mandate. So on a plain reading, the first reading you said, five years of age, less than five years of age, custody goes to mother. Now this concept has been done away with in Lahari Sakhamuri's case by the Supreme Court. I have uh, given the judgments, so you needn't uh, bother with the citations. But I'm going to read to you something which I was able to convince the Supreme Court after a good 10 years in the High Court. I amalgamated the definition of the best interest of the child with Section 6. And the way Justice Khanvelkar expressed himself is in Para 43 of Lari Sakaburi. The expression best interest of the child, which is always to be kept of paramount consideration, is indeed wide in its connotation. Now, the key words, and it cannot remain the love and care of the primary caregiver, the mother, in the case of an infant who is only a few years old. So the explicit exclusion and statutory mandate is not there. The word ordinarily only means the love and care can swing either way. Today I was reading in the Economic Times, all big corporate companies are granting paternity leave when a child is born. You have sit-home fathers. COVID-19 has taught us that there are parents working from home. So this has given to a new dimension of parenting and parental rights. Now, the Supreme Court further says the definition of the best interest of the child as envisaged in Section 29 of the JJ Act as to mean the basis for any decision regarding the child to ensure fulfillment of his basic needs and identify social well-being and physical, social and intellectual development. So the Supreme Court says that the best interest of the child cannot remain the care of the mother, the primary caregiver, if the child is less than five years of age. So please start thinking differently. Start holding the scale with the best interest of the child. And please don't go by a first reading of the provision because ordinarily has swung by the Supreme Court to mean something different. Now, before I move to the other issue which comes from this, I must also share with you the judgment, the words of the Supreme Court in Vasuda Sethi versus Kiran Bhaskar decided on 12th of January 2022, where again the Supreme Court is saying when a court decides that it is in the best interest of the minor to remain in the custody of one parent, the other parent is bound to be affected. In the case of a minor boy or girl, the natural guardian is the father, but ordinarily the custody of the minor who is not completely the age of age shall be the mother. The, the Supreme Court further says on a conjoint reading of section 1, subsection 1 of section 13, th- that is uh, the welfare of the child, and section 6A of the HMGA, if it is found that the welfare of a minor whose age is more than five years requires that the custody should be with the mother, the court is 
bound to do so. But here comes the other side. In the same way, if interest of the minor, which is the paramount consideration, requires that the custody of the minor should not be with the mother, the court will be justified in disturbing the custody of the mother, even if the minor is less than five years of age. So here is the writing. There is no vested right with the mother if the child is less than five years of age. There is no vested right of the father if the child is more than five years of age. Please try to adapt to these new principles which the Supreme Court has evolved in these two judgments. Kindly don't go by a first reading of the words. They are going into different connotations is with the advancement of time, evolving perceptions, and with equal parenting rights. We are divided. We, are, we have gender-based thinking ingrained in us. We have to change. We have to think differently. We ought not to determine simply on the basis of the father or the mother. The child is not a table or a chair who is to be given to the mother or the father. The child is a person. Keep in mind the UNCRC. Please read the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child to understand what is the child needs. So in this perspective is coming one concept. Now the other concept which comes with Section 6 is, which again is a blind alley, is now the mother says I have a right to the child because the child is less than five years of age. Therefore, the mother says my residence is the residence of the child. Now I am going to leave you with this questionnaire and finish my reading of the HMG and come back to this question. Does section six determine jurisdiction in a guardian and wards act petition? The straight answer is no, because the answer is in section nine of the Guardian and Wards Act, where the minor ordinarily resides. Not where the mother ordinarily resides. A lot of people get confused with this thinking and say, mother, child less than five years of age, custody with mother, wherever mother is living is the residence of the child. I, I personally feel this is the wrong connotation. There are different views of different high courts on this. And the Delhi High Court in JK versus NS has discussed threadbare these judgments after I urged to the court that this is a, a different connotation. There are six high courts on one side holding that the right, the residence of the mother is not the residence of the child. Our high court is on the view that the residence of the mother is the residence of the child. The Supreme Court affirming the judgment in JK versus NS has in a way given a mandate that, that that is the position, but there is no clear explicit view of the Supreme Court on this. So this is again a gray area for the timing. Now I want to quickly run through the remaining provisions of the uh, HNGA. Now section 8 talks of the powers of a guardian. So, whosoever has the custody, the guardian does not lose his powers. That's one. Then come to section 13. Welfare of the child to be the paramount constitution. Now, this is something very important. Now, section 13 itself carves out the exception to section 6. So, if you stop reading after section 6 and you don't read 13, you miss the bus. Now, section 13 says, in the appointment or declaration of any person, the welfare of the minor shall be paramount. Then here is the bar. No person shall be entitled to the guardianship by virtue of the provisions of this act or any other law amongst Hindus if the court is of the opinion that his or her guardianship will not be for the welfare of the minor. So you fall back on the best interest of the child, the welfare of the child. So no parent has a sublime right. No parent has a vested or an absolute right. It is a subjective right. 
the scale is the welfare of the child. Nobody can claim exclusive priority simply because the child is X years of age or Y years of age. You have no right by virtue of being a parent. There is no superior or inferior parent. Both parents are equal. But what is the welfare of the child? How do you balance that? That is the crunch. Now, with this brief introduction of this act and the way I read it, now let us look at some, some provisions of the Guardian and Wards Act. Now, first of all, the Guardian and Wards Act in section 7 talks of power of the court to declare a guardian. So it says where the court is satisfied that it is for the welfare of the minor, an order should be made, it, it can appoint a guardian or declare a guardian. Then persons entitled to be appointed a guardian is in section 8. And any person desiring of being declared a guardian can do so. But then the question comes, if you're a natural guardian, do you need a declaration as a guardian? Now, this is something which, which, which seeks to be answered in a perspective that you cannot displace the guardian of his rights. You can only confer custody. The natural guardian's rights can never be taken away. And I come straight to the exception, which is in section 19. Section 19 says that the guardian is not to be appointed in certain cases. So it, it says in 19b that a minor's guardian, that is the father and mother, until and unless they are declared unfit to be in the opinion of the court, the guardianship cannot go. So please be careful when you decide guardianship rights that the declaration of unfitness is something you have to establish on substantive evidence. And it is a unfitness which has to be established on the basis of cogent evidence. You can displace custody. You can give visitation. But guardianship is something you cannot take away by virtue of this provision. Then we come to section 12 next. Now, section 12, talking of interlocutory orders, integrum of a petition for guardianship is very meaningful and it gives you the power to act in a way which I am going to explain to you the way I read it. The court may direct that if any person having the custody of the minor shall produce him or cause him to be produced and at such time as it may point and may make such order for temporary custody and protection of the person or property or the minor as it thinks fit. Now, I say that the word such order and temporary custody means you are free to evolve your shared custody and joint parenting plan. So, if someone were to say to you that shared custody and joint parenting plan is not to be found in the statute, I would disagree because I would think that such order or temporary custody is, is given to you by virtue of your power to pass an interlocutory order under Section 12. And if we look at the Family Courts Act of 1984, your powers under Section 12 and Section 14, permitting you to lay down a procedure for arriving at a settlement or coming to the truth of the facts alleged by one party or the other, and then in that process, taking in a document, dehores the Evidence Act, gives you complete freedom under Section 12 to come out at the interim stage with a direction to the parties, please prepare a shared custody or a joint parenting plan for the best interest and welfare of the child. Now, with this, I run. I will run through briefly some provisions of the Family Courts Act, which, of course, may not be very elaborate for the time being now. Now, your jurisdiction in, for guardianship and custody matters arises 
from section 7 explanation number G, a suit or proceeding in relation to guardianship, or custody or access to the minor. Now, as far as the procedure and other issues are concerned, I needn't read through it. But again, what is important is that your determination again is to rest on the best interest and welfare of the child. And again, the same principles have to be followed. Now, let us look at a judgment from a very wide perspective as to what jurisdictional issues will mean. Now, I just wish to elaborate on the concept of where the difference of opinion arises. Now, the Supreme Court in Tejaswini Gods, that is 2019, 7 SCC 42, said that the Guardian and Wards Act, the jurisdiction of the court, is determined where the minor ordinarily resides within the area of the court exercising such jurisdiction. So, Section 6 of the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act does not determine jurisdiction. Now, the second judgment on the point is Ruchi Maju. Ruchi Maju is the Bible in jurisdiction, 2011, 6 SEC, 479. Now, Ruchi Maju says, in cases arising out of proceedings under the Guardian and Wards Act, jurisdiction of the court is determined from where the minor ordinarily resides in the jurisdiction of the court. There is a significant di difference between the jurisdictional facts by a writ court and by a guardian and wards act court. And then, para 62, the crunch, it says, it does not hold much persuasion, it, it does not require much persuasion to hold that whether the court should examine the matter or not will rest on the fact that the court, which has no jurisdiction, to entertain a petition cannot pass any order with respect to the return of the child. And the party may be acquired, uh, required to uh, invoke the jurisdiction of the appropriate court. Now, in this case, the Supreme Court says that a court that has no jurisdiction to entertain a petition for custody cannot pass any order or issue any direction for the return of the child the party aggrieved must seek remedy before the court legally, the remedy open to it legally, but no redress can be made for the court which is no jurisdiction. Now, if we look into this provision carefully, minor ordinarily resides has to be read in for jurisdiction. So, the residence of the mother has not to be read in into the conferment of jurisdiction under Section 9 of the Guardian and Wards Act. Section 6 is not, HMGA is not the determining provision. Section 9 of the GWA is the determining provision. Now, what does minor ordinarily reside mean? It means n number of judgments say where the child continuously and habitually resides. Not residing at a place where the child is present on the date the petition is filed. It is not a place where a child is removed by force or brought for the filing of the petition. So this is again your judgment to determine where is the child residing, where is the child going to school, which is his home, which is his habitual place of living and so on and so forth. If you find that the child is not residing in your jurisdiction habitually, ordinarily and permanently, the petition has to be declined. You can do so by a preliminary issue. You can do it in an Order 7 Rule 11 application or the best way you think fit. But Ruchi Maju says you have no jurisdiction. And Tejaswini God is very clear that the determination of this has to be done on the anvil of Section 9 of the GWA and not on Section 6 of the HFGA. So this is one very big hurdle which uh, needs to be clarified and which needs to be uh, explained in the perspective of the jurisdictional issue. Now, having said that, the 
bigger, larger picture of what should be your method and procedure of handling a guardian and wards act petition is best laid out in the latest judgment of the Supreme Court in Aman Loya's case. This is 2021 SCC Online, SC224. I have circulated this judgment. Now, this was a case where I had argued the matter before the Supreme Court, and it had a very interesting set of facts. The uh, petitioner before the Supreme Court was also the uh, applicant or the petitioner before the family court in a guardianship petition. He was unsuccessful in getting the visitation, access and custody of his child before the family court. He took the unlawful route of taking the child out of the country uh, by uh, Bagdogra, Nepal, and then going to Dubai and converting the Muslim religion. The matter went to the High Court in a habeas corpus petition. He did not appear. Criminal contempt proceedings were initiated against him. He was held to be guilty of criminal contempt. Ultimately, a team of CBI was sent to bring him back. The matter was urged before the Supreme Court in all those matters. The criminal issues are still pending. But then the uh, family court's decision, meanwhile, was that it permitted the mother to transpose in place of the father as a petitioner. And on one date of hearing, the uh, family court not only transposed the uh, mother as a petitioner, but also gave her exclusive guardianship rights. This order was questioned by the father in an appeal before the High Court. The Supreme Court transferred the appeal to its board and it expounded on the jurisdictional aspects of how a family court ought to determine a guardianship petition. So the Supreme Court did lay down, but I want to dwell on para 25 of the Supreme Court judgment dated March 17, 2021. Now, which is very important from you, for your point of perspective, it says, it says, as a matter of fact, in the Indian context, the provisions of the 1984 Act, nor the 1890 Act, envisage a direction in favor of the parent to be declared as the sole exclusive and absolute guardian and custodian of the minor. Such declaration has been intentionally obtained by the respondent from the family court to serve a ulterior purpose. Then the appellant has taken us through the points to buttress the argument that the respondent is not a fit person. According to the appellant, the father being the natural guardian under Hindu law is entitled to a declaration of guardianship unless it is found in a given case that is unfit in the context of parenting of the minor child or would be against the interest in welfare of the minor child, as the case may be. According to the appellant, the father is the natural guardian, irrespective of the mother's custody. The guardianship of the father cannot be divested to buttress his contention reliance placed on so-and-so. It is contended that unless and until the father is declared unfit, the relief of declaring him to be guardian cannot be declined. The fact that the appellant had taken the child away from the jurisdiction of the family court does not mean that he was the kidnapper of the child and he continues to be the natural guardian. So the point which I'm trying to bring home is that if a declaration has to be given to you by you declaring a parent as the natural guardian ex exclusively, unless and until you declare the other parent as an unfit parent, this declaration cannot be given. You can share the custody, you can give exclusive custody, but parenting rights cannot be divested or given away in this process. Now, the second important point which this judgment brings home is in paras 36 to 40 onwards, where the Supreme Court says you, there is a mandatory procedure for you to follow. A family court is not a writ court. So whatever is the mandatory procedure of pleadings, coining issues, then recording evidence, then coming to a conclusion, giving opportunity, you have to fulfill. Now, the argument of the other side was that CPC and Evidence Act can be given a go by. But the Supreme Court's rebuttal is you cannot obviate, you cannot dispense away this is statutory procedure. You have to follow the statutory procedure and then you can coin your own 
procedural aspect for leading of evidence, meaning thereby, if you want evidence to be sworn in, you can take by way of affidavit the examination and the cross-examination can be verbal. It saves time, it's quicker. It's very common in Delhi to give the to give a pen drive giving an affidavit so that time is saved. The judge can read through the evidence while the cross is being conducted by the opposite side. Obviously, the pen drive containing the affidavit is already served to the opposite party in advance. But I have done trials in six months where the court is able to finish it off if helpful expedited procedures are adopted. But this is something you have to devise within your own court to come to these issues. Now, the next thing which the Supreme Court says is abandonment should not be inferred. Transposing should not be entertained ex party. Opportunity should be given. Now, these are important points which you can go through at length. Substantial non-compliance of procedure cannot be done away. Fitness of the appellant to be decided on merits. Now, the ultimate relief the Supreme Court was awarded was it set aside the order of the family court, remanded the matter back to the family court, but it has laid down in a detailed way the procedure which is mandated to be followed under the Guardian and Wards Act and the Family Courts Act. So this is something on the jurisdictional issue. Now, I I know I'm short of time, so I will very quickly cover three different aspects which I think need focus. Now, the first is your approach in a guardianship petition should be a child-centric approach. Do not be misled by parties converting it into a divorce petition or an attack on each other of marital rights. When people talk of marital rights, you can ask the councils to refrain from referring to the pleadings. In Kiran Bhaskar's case, which I just read, I was an amicus before the Supreme Court. There were 2,000 pages of allegations by the parties against each other when we were looking at the child. So the judge said, I'm not going to look into anything. And he asked me for a balanced view. So I gave a report and we looked at the issues concerning the child and we came out with something of a joint parenting plan. And that's how we were able to come out of it. You have a power to appoint an amicus. You, it's in the act. You have the power to take assistance. Feel free, appoint in Bombay. There is a child independent lawyer. There is a panel of 30 lawyers maintained by the court. And out of that, they pick up a lawyer for the child. And the judge sometimes only hears the lawyer for the child because left and right is only allegations. So the child welfare, the child independent lawyer seeks the report of a counselor and comes out with an answer. And then the matter goes forward. Now, I personally feel the way out is in section 12, you have a power to make an interlocutory order. Now, the word such order means you can tell the party, I am not going to proceed with the matter till you come up with a shared parenting plan or a joint parenting plan. If somebody wants custody, tell him you will have to bargain for custody on Saturday and Sunday. If one parent wants only visitation, give him visitation, balance it and come out with a joint parenting plan in the beginning so that the litigation can proceed smoothly thereafter. So a child-centric approach is something which is very necessary and which has been laid down in Ashish Ranjan's case and in, 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 in Ruchi Maju's case where the judge says, when the court says, Supreme Court says, it is very necessary for this issue to come forth in that way. Now, the concept of a joint or a shared parenting plan is found in Tushar Obale, Supreme Court, Bombay High Court, Karnataka High Court judgment in Sita Raman's case, Kiran Bhaskar R High Court, in JK versus NS in the Delhi High Court. Now, this is something which is not an alien concept. Please don't feel that shared parenting or joint parenting is not a word used in the act. And therefore, you, you, you don't know how you will resolve it. You have to read into the word section 12. In section 12, I'm going to just very quickly emphasize on those words again so that they stick to the mind. So section 12 of the uh, 
for the section um, 12 of the Guardian and Wards Act says, uh, the court may make such order for temporary custody. So such order means shared custody order. Temporary custody means joint parenting plan. So extend the interpretation of these words and with the freedom you have under section 12 and section 14 of the Family Courts Act, you can devise a procedure of your own. It's not alien to you. And you have judgment of Tushar Bale, Bombay High Court, Sita Raman Rama was in Karnataka High Court, JK versus NS Delhi High Court, Kiran Baskar, just Justice Tyagi's judgment, which very clearly says, nothing in this order shall prevent the parties from adopting a joint parenting plan as agreed to in the welfare of the parties for whatever reason. So in the best interest and welfare of the child, being the paramount constitution, you can pick it up and you can adopt that method. Now, what is the fallout and the negative side of you, this if you don't do it? Vivek Singh versus Romani Singh. Just a secretly identified parental alienation syndrome as a serious disorder. And the WHO now classifies it as a psychiatric disorder among children, where a child polarized or alienated by virtue of missing contact with the other parent starts feeling that the other parent is bad, he is tutored or taught by the other parties. I saw this very seriously in a case which I must relate to you in, in just a minute. There was a couple belonging, I will not name the city, in Haryana, whereby they were they had parted company because the man was traveling up and about. So the mother took the children and went to her paternal, maternal home. And the father, upon realizing that he could not find them, tried to contact her and she told him that I'm in, I'm in a foreign country. So he applied to the country and got a visitation right. So he was supposed to talk to the child, but because of the time difference, the child was always asleep. There were two children. The other child was all right. So one day he noticed a fan on the rotating on the ceiling. So he got suspicious. He landed up at the home, the maternal grandparents' home, and he found his child there. So when he tried to recover the child, there was an altercation and an ugly issue resulted. So he came to the high court in a habeas corpus and the court was able to order that the child should be returned to the father. But then uh, during the course of the proceedings, he tried to talk to his other child who was with the mother. And the child was using very abusive language for an 11 or a 12 year old. And that was a clear import that the child was being tutored. So parents will tend to use children as their pawns and in in, in, and, and influence them in such a way that they get this, they get polarized or they get affected to be on one side. Now, this is a very negative aspect and it needs to be handled very gently. So, looking at this entire circumference, I now pass the baton on to the Honorable Judge who perhaps is better trained than me because she's on the other side, I am on this side. So, with this brief narration of mine, I, I wrap up and I pass the baton back on to Dr. Gupta. Yes, now Madhu can start with the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we are already running very short of time. So I'll have to speed up. It's a privilege to speak and, uh, on this platform again. Ch uh, childhood, uh, childhood is not a race to see how quickly a child can read, write or count. Rather, childhood is a small window of time to learn and develop at the pace, which is right for each individual child. In 1893, Lord Lindley Justice had observed that the dominant matter for consideration of the court is the welfare of the child. But the welfare of the child is not to be measured by money only, nor by physical comforts only. The moral and religious welfare of the child must be considered as its physical well-being, nor can the ties of affection be disregarded. Custody of a child refers to the right given to a parent by the court to look after the minor child. 
Child supported visitation rights also have a positive effect on the child. Frequent meetings with non custodian parent will make him believe that he is still close to his parent. When the child will receive emotional as well as financial support from non custodian parent, it will certainly develop a strong bond of love and affection between them and also instill a sense of security and comfort in the child. Now, as has already been discussed by Mr. Malhotra, uh, the statutory uh, law which is um, prevalent in the country is the Guardians and Wards Act 1890, which is the common law that provides remedies for parents undergoing custody battles after divorce. The act pertains to general law, irrespective of the religion of the parents, whereas Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act 1956 deals with certain parts of law relating to minority and guardianship among Hindus. Now, Section 6A of uh, Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act has remained in controversy for a long time since the plain reading of the law portrays that father is the natural guardian of the minor and after him, the mother could be the natural guardian. Thus, on the face of it, the subclause violates the doctrine of equality enshrined in Articles 14 and 15 of the Constitution. In Gita Hariharan's case, Gita Hariharan versus Reserve Bank of India, 1992, uh, 1999, sorry, Volume 2, SCC, 2 to 8, the question arose as to whether Section 6A of the Act discriminates between father and mother on the sole basis of sex. The Honorable Apex Court observed that whenever a dispute concerning the guardianship of a minor between the father and mother of the minor is raised in a court of law, the word after in the section would have no significance as the court is primarily concerned with the best interest of the minor and his welfare in the widest sense while determining the question as regards custody and guardianship of the minor. The father continued, uh, 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 sorry, the uh, uh, I'll just discuss a little bit more on that. Uh, by majority view, the Honorable Supreme Court interpreted the word after in Section 6 uh, as not necessarily meaning after the lifetime. It rather means in the absence of the word absence referring to father's absence from the uh, from the care of the minor's property or person for any reason whatsoever. Now, example can be if father is wholly indifferent to the mother of the minor. Or by mutual understanding, mother is made in charge of the minor or father is physically unable to take care of the minor either because he is staying away or he has physical or mental incapacity. Now the problem that emerged was how to address the situation where no one is at fault. The father continued to have a preferential position when it comes to natural guardianship and the mother becomes a natural guardian only in exceptional circumstances as the Honorable Supreme Court has explained in Geeta Hariharan's case. But with the passage of time through various judicial pronouncements, it is established that all statutory guardianship arrangements are ultimately subject to the principle contained in Section 13. That is the welfare of the minor is the paramount consideration. Now, uh, what are the factors which have to be considered by the court when appointing guardians? These have been enumerated in Section 17 of the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act 1956. And the court has to take into account the age, sex and religion of the minor, the character and capacity of the proposed guardian and how closely related is the proposed guardian to the minor. The wishes, if any, of the deceased parents. And any existing or previous relation of the proposed guardian with the person or property of the guardian uh, of the minor, sorry. And section 17 clearly stipulates that if the minor is old enough to form an intelligent opinion, the court may consider his or her preference. Now this was under the Hindu law, under the Muslim law, 
the father is the natural guardian, but custody vests with the mother until the son reaches the age of seven and the daughter reaches puberty. Uh, Muslim law is the earliest legal system to provide for a clear distinction between guardianship and custody and also for explicit recognition of the right of the mother to custody. The concept of Hizanat provides that of all persons, the mother is the most suited to have the custody of her children up to a certain age, both during the marriage and after its dissolution. A mother cannot be deprived of this right unless she is disqualified because of apostasy or misconduct and her custody is found to be unfavorable to the welfare of the child. In judicial decisions under the Guardian and Wards Act involving Muslim children, courts have sometimes upheld the mother's right to custody over children under Islamic law and on other occasions have given custody to the mother out of concern for the welfare of the child. The uh, important citations uh, can be noted down in uh, this is uh, Suharabi versus D. Muhammad, AIR 1988, Kerala 36, where mother was authorized to have custody of a daughter of uh, one and a half year old age. Then Muhammad Jamil Ahmed Ansari versus Ishrat Sajida, AIR 1983, AP 106, where uh, the custody of an 11 year old boy was given to the father on the ground that Muslim law allowed the mother to have exclusive custody only until the age of seven. In Muhammad Begum versus Mubarak Hussain, AIR 1986 MP 221, where the Honorable Madhya Pradesh High Court interpreted Mohammedan law to allow custody for the mother. Now the question arises, who has the priority claim to the custody of a child? Uh, this has already been discussed that the welfare of the minor is the only consideration irrespective of the claims of the parties to the custody. The court is not required to take into consideration whether from any other point of view, the claim of the father in respect of such custody or upbringing is superior to that of the mother or the claim of the mother is superior to that of the father. In relation to the custody or upbringing of a minor, a mother has the same rights and authority as the law allows to a father and the rights and authority of mother and father are equal and are exercisable by either without the other. Each case has to be decided on its own facts and other decided cases can hardly serve as binding precedents in so far as the factual aspect aspects of the case are concerned. Better financial resources of either of the parents or their love for the child may be one of the relevant considerations, but cannot be the sole determining factor for the custody of the child. Uh, in fact, no statute on the subject can ignore, eschew or obliterate the vit vital factor of the welfare of the minor. This was discussed in a case titled Mosami Moitra Ganguli versus Jayanti Ganguly, AIR 2008, Supreme Court, 2262. Now, absolute right of parents over their destinies and lives of their children in the modern changed social conditions must yield to the considerations of their welfare as human beings so that they may grow up in a normal, balanced manner to be useful members of the society and the guardian court in case of a dispute between the mother and the father is expected to strike a just and proper balance between the requirements of welfare of the minor children and the rights of their respective parents over them. Now we are talking about welfare. Uh, Mr. Malhotra has of course explained the meaning of welfare, but I'll take the liberty to discuss this again. In case titled Neil Ratan Kundu versus Abhijit Kundu, 2008, Volume 9, SCC 413, the meaning of uh, the term welfare was explained and it was held that a court while de dealing with custody cases is neither bind bound by statutes nor by strict rules of evidence or procedure nor by precedents. 
in selecting proper guardian of a minor, the paramount consideration should be the welfare and well-being of the child. In selecting a guardian, the court is exercising parents' patria jurisdiction and is expected rather bound to give weight to a child's ordinary comfort, contentment, health, education, intellectual development, and favorable surroundings. But over and above physical comforts, moral and ethical values cannot be ignored. They are equally or even more important, essential, and indispensable considerations. If the minor is old enough to form an intelligent preference or judgment, the court must consider such preference as well, though the final decision should rest with the court as to what is conducive to the welfare of the minor. Then in Sarita Sharma versus Sush uh, Sushil Sharma, 2000, Volume 2, RCR Civil 367, the Honorable Apex Court held that Section 6 of the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act constitutes father as a natural guardian of a minor, but that provision cannot supersede the paramount consideration as to what is conducive to the welfare of the minor. Uh, the crucial factors which have to be kept in mind by the courts while deciding the welfare of the children has been discussed in uh, Lehri's Sakhamuri versus Sobhan Kodali, 2019, Volume 7, SCC 311. So what is essential is maturity and judgment, mental stability, ability to provide access to schools, moral character, ability to provide continuing involvement in the community, financial sufficiency, factors involving relationship with the child as opposed to characteristics of the parent as an individual. Then in Tejaswani Gaur versus Shekhar Jagdish Prasad Tiwari, 2019, Volume 7, SCC 42. Uh, it was uh, held that the welfare of the child shall include various factors like ethical upbringing, economic well-being of the guardian, child's ordinary comfort, contentment, health, education, etc. Now there are circumstances uh, where uh, neither the parent nor the uh, uh, neither of the parent is uh, actually uh, suitable to be appointed as a guardian. In certain circumstances or in such circumstances, uh, courts have also sent the child to boarding schools. So I'll just give you the citations like Shioli Hati versus Somnath Das 2019, Volume 7, SCC 490. The child was removed from the influence of home life and directed to continue to remain in the boarding school. It was held that in the facts and circumstances of the case, this was considered the best way to serve the welfare and interest of the child as the atmosphere in her home was unhealthy, which had caused a very great strain on her nerves and had certainly affected her healthy growth. Similarly, in Amri Rai versus Satpal, AIR 1983, Punjab and Haryana 304, uh, the court directed that the child should be sent to a boarding school as the acrimonious atmosphere in the house would have a bad effect on the proper growth of the child. Then it is very important to remember that siblings should not be separated, especially uh, when they are very close to each other. In case title, Shaleen Kabra versus Shivani Kabra, 2012, Volume 2, RCR Civil 974, the Honorable Apex Court has given this observation. So here the court had given custody of elder son to the husband and that of the younger son to the wife. So this order was modified and the custody of both the children was given to the father uh, with visiting right to the mother at the expense of the father. Now what happens if the father is in live-in relationship? In uh, uh, case titled Naresh Kumar versus Anita Rani. 2019, Volume 2, RCR Civil 366. 
it was held that uh, the court cannot approve this kind of social setup because it would give a wrong signal to the society at large and would create an adverse impact on the tender mind of the child. And there are chances that the child would learn that live in relationship is a way of life. Now the principles in relation to the custody of a minor child are well settled. In determining the question as to who should be given custody of a minor child, the paramount consideration is the welfare of the child and not rights of the parents under a statute for the time being in force. But there are uh, circumstances where the custody is not given to the parents, but is given to other relatives. In Jay Prakash Khadariya versus Sham Sundar Abgarwal, 2000, Volume 6, SCC 598, there was a dispute between paternal and maternal grandparents, and here the custody was given to paternal grandfather. Then in Anjali Kapoor versus Rajiv Bajal, AIR 2009, Supreme Court 2821, the custody of the child was handed over to the grandmother rather than the father. In Shamrao Maroti Korvate versus Deepak Kisanrao Tekram, 2010, Volume 10, SCC 31, the custody of the minor child was given to the maternal grandfather and not to the father. In Neelam versus Mansingh, 2015, Volume 2, RCR Civil 291, custody of minor child residing with grandparents where father is dead and the mother is facing criminal prosecution under Section 306 IPC for abetting his suicide. Uh, in such circumstances, custody of the child uh, was ordered to remain with grandparents and the mother was even denied the visitation rights. Then in Kirti Kumar Maheshankar Joshi versus Pradeep Kumar Karuna Shankar Joshi, 1992, Volume 3, SEC 573, the Honorable Supreme Court uh, handed over the custody of minor children to maternal uncle, refusing the preferential right of the custody, uh, 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 preferential right of the father to the custody of his minor children. Then in Neil Ratan Kundu uh, versus Abhijit Kundu, which we just discussed here and before, a case under Section 498A IPC had been registered against father of the child. Here, the custody of the five-year-old five child was given to the grandparents and the custody petition of the father was dismissed. So again, a question arises whether it is permissible to hand over the custody of the child to an institution, ignoring parents' claim. So ordinarily, no. This was answered in Bieta Agni Zeka Sobia Raj versus State of Himachal Pradesh. 2016, Volume 4, RCR Civil, page number 4. Uh, but uh, there's another case, Shaurya Gautam versus State of UP, 2020, SCC Online, Allahabad, 1372, where it was observed that if a natural guardian is facing criminal charges relating to death of the spouse, then in that event, uh, the court allowed custody of the children to remain with the ashram and the visitation rights to the father were also declined. Then in case of, uh, in case of custody of illegitimate child, the mother has an indefeasible legal right to natural guardianship vis-a-vis -vis an illegitimate child. This is Dharmesh Vasantrai Shah versus Renuka Prakash Tewari, 2020, SCC Online, Bombay, 697. Now, preference, uh, preferences and inclinations of child are important in determining issue of parental custody. In case title Samriti Madan uh, Kansagra versus Peri Kansagra, 2020, SCC Online, SC919, the Honorable Apex Court, uh, uh, has uh, uh, observed that uh, the court can consider the preference of the minor if she uh, or he is old enough to form an intelligent preference. It would be in the best interest of the child to transfer custody to his father as if the preferences were not given due regard, it could have an adverse 
psychological impact on the child. And this is very important that the psychological aspect of the child's emotions to Aurora and others. 2017 volume 3 SCC 726. Uh, it was held that court should desist from passing order for custody. Contrary to the will of the girl child, which may give rise to tormenting and disturbing experience in her mind. In this case, the custody of the girl child aged 15 years was given to the father by holding that it was for her welfare. Now in Purvi Mukesh Gada versus Mukesh Popatlal Gada and others, AIR 9, uh, 2017 Supreme Court 5407, it was held that regard should be given to the child's opinion if she can understand his or her welfare. The, the Honorable Apex Court, besides other factors, also took into consideration the wishes of the minors and accordingly awarded custody to the mother. It was not, uh, in Ashanka versus Prakash 2020 SSC Online Bombay 3497. Uh, the Honorable Bench interacted with the child aged 10 years in the chambers and she stated that she was comfortable at her father's place, but her uh, attachment with the mother was also explicit and she showed willingness to meet her mother. So the Honorable Bench stated that it is not basing its conclusion only by taking into consideration the better financial position of father, but that is one of the factors amongst others. Visiting rights were granted to the mother in view of the child's inclination to meet her mother frequently. And it was held that a father would bear the tra travel and stay expenses. So in uh, Bijay K. Prasad versus Ranjana 1999 volume 9 SEC 544, uh, the child stated that uh, she wanted to stay with the father. As she was staying with the father since the past eight years, direct, uh, the child was ordered to stay with the father and the directions given by the mother that uh, she would spend holidays, uh, the directions given by the family court that the uh, child would spend uh, time on uh, the time of holidays with mother was set aside. Now what is important is that court has to see that pre preferences of the child are free from any undue influence the tutored and prepaid statement, uh, pre-prepared statements of the uh, minor are not to be considered as their wishes. And importance has to be given to their level of maturity and their surroundings, uh, surroundings, etc. The court has to be satisfied that the preference of the child is free from any kind of undue influence. Now, Section 26 of the Guardians and Wards Act says that a guardian appointed by court cannot without the leave of the court by which he was appointed, remove the child from the limits of the jurisdiction except for such purposes as may be prescribed. Section 44 of the said act prescribes the penalty where the ward is removed from the limits of the jurisdiction of the court by the guardian without the leave of the court. Now there is, um, we can talk about the international child abduction also. No, there is no statute or legislation regarding the rights of parents in case of international child abduction. India is not a signatory to any convention or treaty related to the international child abduction. The laws governing such a uh, situation are only precedent based. In 2016, the Ministry of Women and Child uh, child development had drafted a bill. The civil aspects of child abduction in the 263rd report, the Law Commission submitted a draft bill, the protection of children, inter-country removal and retention bill 2016, but still there is no legislation in this regard. In Nithya Anand Raghavan versus State and City of Delhi 2017 volume 8 SCC 454 uh, the, uh, it was uh, observed that uh, Indian courts are not to get fixated with orders of the foreign courts and that they have to be guided only by the best interest of a child in custody battles. 
it was further uh, held that courts in India were not obligated to ratify the orders passed by foreign courts when the paramount interest of the child could be in peril by such approvals and noted that India was still not a signatory to the Hague Convention and would therefore not breach any international obligation if domestic courts applied their minds independently in custody cases. It further underlined that the principle of comity of courts cannot be given primacy or more weightage for deciding the matter of custody or for return of the child to the native state. If the child has been brought within India, the courts in India may conduct summary inquiry or an elaborate inquiry on the question of custody. In the case of a summary inquiry, the court may deem it fit to order the return of the child to the country from where he or she was removed unless such return is shown to be harmful to the child. In other words, even in the matter of a summary inquiry, it is open to the court to decline the relief of return of the child to the country from where he or she was removed irrespective of a pre-existing order of return of the child by a foreign court. The invocation of first strike principle as a decisive factor would undermine and whittle down the wholesome principle of the duty of the court having jurisdiction to consider the best interests and welfare of the child, which is of paramount importance. With regard to non-convention countries, the law is that the court in the country to which the child is removed while considering the question must bear in mind the welfare of the child as of paramount importance and consider the order of the foreign country a foreign court as only a factor to be taken into consideration the summary jurisdiction to return the child be exercised in cases where the child had been removed from its native land and moved to another country where uh, maybe his native language is not spoken or the child gets divorced from the social customs and contacts to which he has been accustomed or if its education in his native land is interrupted and the child is being subjected to foreign system of education. For these are all acts which could psychologically disturb the child. Now again, the summary jurisdiction be exercised only if the court to which the child has been removed is moved promptly and quickly. The overriding consideration must be interests and welfare of the child. Even in Ruchi Maju versus Sanjeev Maju, AIR 2011, SC 1952, uh, it was observed that principle of comity of courts ensures that foreign judgments and orders are unconditionally conclusive of the matters in controversy. But in the matter of custody of child, uh, child interest and welfare of the minor being paramount, a competent court in this country is entitled and indeed duty bound to examine the matter independently, taking the foreign judgment, if any, only as an input for its final adjudication. In um, uh, Elizabeth Dinshaw versus Arvind M. Dinshaw and another 1987 SCR Volume 1, 175, the Honorable Apex Court has reiterated that a parent doing wrong by removing children out of the country, uh, it uh, should not gain any advantage by his or her wrongdoing and it is the uh, duty of the court to see that no such benefit is given to the wrong parent. Now, jurisdiction point has already been discussed by Mr. Anil Malhotra. Uh, that is section nine. Person, in case of a person, uh, the uh, it shall be made to the district court having jurisdiction in the place where the minor ordinarily resides and property where the minor ordinarily resides or where the property is situated. Now, uh, the word minor ordinarily res uh, resides has also been discussed by Mr. Malhotra, but um, 
I would like to uh, refer to a judgment on this point. This is Jagdish Chandra Gupta versus Dr. Kumari Vimla Gupta, AIR 2003, Allahabad 317. The ordinary resident uh, uh, ordinarily resides and residing at the time of the application are not synonym, synonyms and stipulate different situations which are not interchanged. The place where the minor ordinarily resides indicates a place where the minor is expected to reside, but for special circumstances. It excludes places to which the minor may be removed at or about the time of the filing of the application for the enforcement of the guardianship and custody of the minor. The place has to be determined by finding out as to where the minor was ordinarily residing and where such residents would have continued but for the re recent removal of the minor to a different place. The mere fact that a minor is found actually residing at a place at the time of the application is made by itself is not sufficient to determine the jurisdiction. Now, where minor ordinarily resides has been used intentionally in the statute for excluding places to which the minor may be removed at or about the time of filing of the application for the enforcement of the guardianship and custody of the minor. The legislature intended to avoid inconvenience to the minor. Jurisdiction is conferred upon the court where the minor has been residing for a reasonably long period. If the minor less than five years old has been wrongly removed, the custody of such minor shall be deemed to be with the mother. Now, in this regard, I'll refer to Casey Shashidhar versus Rupa, ILR 1992 Karnataka 2791. In this case, the wife was driven out from the matrimonial home in Mumbai, but the custody of the child was not given to her. She started living in Mysore and filed the petition for custody of the child. The Honorable Karnataka High Court held that under the Guardians and Wards Act, a minor child is expected to be with the custody of the mother, and therefore the words ordinarily resides should be construed as the place where the mother resides before the presentation of the petition. In Kuldeep Kaur versus Sukhvinder Singh, 2009, Volume 9, RCR Civil 485, the claim was made by the father for the custody of minor daughters. Mother was residing in District Alwar. Daughters were admitted in a school there. Address of mother in the petition is also shown as that of District Alwar. So in this case, the Honorable uh, Punjab and Haryana High Court has held that as per Section 9, Guardians and Wards Act, the court at District Alwar is the competent court. Now there's another case, Akshay Gupta versus Divya and others, 2021, Volume 1, RCR Civil, 722. In this case, after separation, mother was residing in Panipat. Physical custody of the child was with the mother. Child was three years and seven months old at the time of filing petition. The child was admitted in a school in Panipat, but later she was wrongly removed by the father from the custody of mother and taken to Yamunanagar. I would repeat that the child was wrongly removed by the father from the custody of mother and taken to Yamunanagar. Of course, the facts are disputed, though it is claimed that the mother had abandoned the child, which is, of course, a matter of evidence. In this case, the jurisdiction has been held of Panipat from where the child was wrongly removed. In Regan Jayapumar versus Shami Sahul, ILR 2015, Volume 3, Kerala 41. Here the parents are living separately at different places and the minor was not residing with them. The primary question is, which is the place where the minor ordinarily resides? The minor child was studying in a school at Pune. So it was held that the district court Pune where the minor ordinarily resides will get the jurisdiction. 
Now for ascertaining that jurisdiction, the family court can verify the school certificate, extract of admission register and other relevant documents to decide the disputed question of fact for identifying the place where the minor ordinarily resides. The school record should be of course of a sufficient long period. Now a question was raised whether uh, the co uh, this jurisdiction can be the question of jurisdiction can be treated as a preliminary issue. Now, unless the jurisdictional facts are admitted, it can never be a pure question of law. When the facts are disputed, then the question about jurisdiction cannot be treated as a preliminary issue as it is a mixed question of law and facts and requires inquiry into the factual aspects of the controversy. Now we'll talk about revocation variation of orders. Section 26 of the Hindu Marriage Act. Uh, courts can pass interim orders in any proceedings with respect to custody, maintenance and education of minor and make such provisions in the decree as it may deem just and proper with respect to the custody, maintenance and education of minor children. The section also authorizes courts to revoke, suspend or vary such interim orders passed previously. In Vikram Veer Vohra vs. Shalini Bhalla, AIR 2010, SC 1675, uh, it was held that um, the uh, custody orders are always considered interlocutory orders and by the nature of such proceedings, custody orders cannot be made rigid and final. They are capable of being altered and molded, keeping in mind the needs of the child. Similarly, in Rosie Jacob vs. Jacob Chakramakal, 1973, 1 SCC 840, uh, all orders relating to custody of minors were considered to be temporary orders and with passage of time, the court is entitled to modify the order in the interest of the minor child. Uh, the court went to the extent of saying that uh, even if orders are based on consent, those orders can also be varied if the welfare of the child so demands. Then Section 38 of Special Marriage Act. This is same as Section 26 HMA and uh, the petition is maintainable under this act if both the parents belong to a different religion or have undertaken a court marriage. Here also um, the application uh, can be disposed of uh, within 16 day 60 days from the date of service of notice. The section also authorizes courts to revoke, suspend or vary such interim orders passed previously. Then what happens? Yes, Madhu. Under Section 45.1, if the person in custody of the child disobeys the order passed under Section 12, sub clause 1, he incurs the liability of payment of. He incurs the liability of payment of prescribed amount of fine as well as detention in civil prison. Uh, unlike the scheme of code uh, CPC dealing with execution of decrees and orders of civil courts, Section 45.1 does not seem to limit the order of detention to any specific period. The detention continues till the child is produced or guardian in default undertakes to produce the child in compliance with the order of the court. In case of failure to fulfill the undertaking given by the concerned parent, within the stipulated time, he may be arrested and recommitted to the civil jail. This is section 45 sub clause 2. Now this is the problem that is faced by most of us that uh, the child is not produced in the court or uh, is not allowed to meet the non-custodian parent. So we can always resort to section 45 of the Guardians and Wards Act. So as we are running short of time, I think I'll just end it. But of course, I'll uh, 
pointed out that the rules framed by the Honorable High Court under the Guardians and Wards Act 1890 are contained in Punjab and Haryana High Court Rules and Orders, Volume 2, Chapter 2B. So with that, I'll uh, end this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madhu. I'm happy that this particular session, which was so vital, covered by both Mr. Anil Malhotra and Madhu Khanalali. You know so much about determining the best interest of the child, and therefore so much has been shared, and yet so much remains to be shared in this particular context. Thank you so much for taking this particular session in a wholesome manner. Both of you have done and contributed extensively in furtherance of this particular session. Thank you so much. Look forward to have you on some other occasion also. Mr. Balotra, of course, Madhu is with us and we continue to have our association. Thank you, Mr. Balotra. So one last question.